So hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to tell you about collections and how to make them faster in Scala. Um, so first to present myself, uh, as a disclaimer I work for Google but I don't do Scala at Google. Uh, and all the views uh, I express here are my own and the copyright of the project as well. Um, so my pedigree is in Scala. Is I've worked uh, on Scala CL uh, four years ago or so, uh, which consisted in trying to run Scala on the graphic card using OpenCL, so transforming the Scala code progressively until it compiles. And um, since then, I've done a lot of hacks. And Scalaxy is the umbrella project under which I put all my macro hacks, and these include the collection speedup. And I also have open source projects uh, like Bridge Generator that help you create bindings for native code from Java, uh, which I also use to create the OpenCL bindings. So that's me. Um, <clears throat> four comprehensions. Um, this is the simplest form of four comprehension in Scala. It does look like a Java for loop, except uh, under the hood, it's actually desugared because uh, it's uh, syntactic sugar is disugared into this expression uh, that uses a, a closure for the body of the loop. And um, yeah, that's a simple example. There are more evolved, advanced examples. Uh, so, more comprehensions can be nested. Uh, you can iterate on multiple collections inside. You can uh, declare variables. Uh, and you can do tests. And you can, re you can return values, you can yield values from a core comprehension. So some of you may know that um, such a core comprehension is disugared using map, flat map, and filter, but it's often fuzzy for most, most of us. Uh, so here's what it actually looks like. Um, so yeah, I can't wrap my head around that. It actually took me a while to clean up the code. Uh, so that's, that's something no one should ever need to read. So if we don't understand that code, how would we do to rewrite the full comprehension uh, by hand? Well, in Java, uh, we would use, uh, in, case, in Java, we would use while loops. We can do it in Scala as well. And it's just a matter of free while loops, which may be error prone. You might forget to increase uh, this index or pick the right uh, pick the wrong index or whatever, but it just works, and it's it's understandable. <clears throat> and the good thing is, it's actually ten times faster for this particular example. Um, and you might think, okay, that's just one instance, but that's actually quite common. Um, take this example here, where we have a range that we filter, that we map, and then we test if all the elements satisfy the predicate. And the equivalent while loop is actually 50 times faster. And that, there's benchmarks in the project if you want to, lots of benchmarks, mm. lots of micro benchmarks uh, with various sizes, gold, hot, uh, JVM, and everything, um, state of the art, I guess. So you might think, yeah, but like, here it's obvious, we have intermediate collections. When you filter your range, you end up with a vector. And we, when you map it, you create another vector. And that's that, obviously. So we could just use an iterator. And an iterator is just a way to make the collection lazy, so it's just consumed as you pull it from, from the end. And there's no intermediate collections created. But it turns out that even an iterator is not as fast as the, the equivalent while loop. It's like five to 20 times slower. And the reason for that is the compiler uh, can only do so much with uh, closure elimination, with uh, like the JVM later on uh, considers most of these calls as completely megamorphic because you can call map on the base uh, collection class with any function, so it doesn't really know how to inline the, 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 the function in the call. Um, and yeah, lots of considerations. Things have improved globally in Scala, in the Scala compiler, but this, this uh, ratio, these figures are still quite common. So, <clears throat> even, <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so this, this is a, a screenshot of the uh, computer language benchmark game. Some of you may know it. Uh, it compares like all the languages with a couple of uh, algorithmic, uh, common algorithmic problems and compares how they perform uh, in real life. And the, all the Scala examples make heavy use of while loops. So that's the dilemma we have. We have a great language, but uh, if we want to use it to its full potential in terms of you know, performance, we need to go down to like grungy while loops. And I don't know you, but I like the candy. I like the, the, the syntactic sugar. Uh, I don't want to have to increment i at the end of my loops, and I don't want to have to profile too much. I, I want things to be fast out of the box, uh, reasonably fast. So that's why I made Galaxy Streams. <laughs> Uh, so in the slide, what is it? Um, it's faster for comprehensions and collections in general. It's safe by default, so it's not going to alter the semantics of your code, and it's very easy to use. To use it with SVT, you just need a dependency. So you, you might notice this provided here. Sorry, it doesn't fit in the line, but um, provided means the dependency is needed at the compilation, at, at compilation time but it's not needed at runtime. Uh, so it's not a runtime dependency at all, it's just here to help the compiler. And so with the macro, you just need to import the optimized macro and you wrap the code that you think is worth optimizing, and boom. And you can also use it in a plugin. So a slide is good. A slide is good, but I'm going to annoy you with more details than you need to know in the next slides, uh, telling you about how Scalaxy works, uh, Scalaxy streams work, in terms of uh, what sources, how it picks the sources, uh, the operations, the nesting of streams, how it eliminates bubbles, how it detects side effects, roughly, uh, the optimization strategies, and um, yeah, that's mostly it. So, what is a stream in the context of uh, Scalaxy? Um, a stream is a source of data, so it could be an array, a list, an option, followed by a sequence of operations, so map, filter, flat map, uh, lots, of, lots of them, and ended by uh, a sync. Uh, that's going to be to list or some or exist. Um, to list could also be an operation in the stream. And then some operations, uh, well, mainly flat map, uh, can actually contain substreams. And that's actually quite useful when you have uh, a nested core comprehension because you actually want to go deep in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the comprehension. And in case you have a builder and you yield something, you want to create one builder at the top and no intermediate connections anywhere. So how do we recognize a stream? Well, in the API, uh, with the reflection APIs, um, and the new Scala 211 quasi codes, it's very easy. It used to be hardcore, I've seen rough days, but um, now you can just use quasi code. So, quasi code is um, a special string interpolation with a Q prefix uh, that actually matches ASTs, and that's as simple as that. So, there's some details like this is a simplified version of the matching of the filter operation. Um, in particular, you would test the target type, you would test lots of things, uh, but it's quite easy for that now. Um, so something that uh, Scalaxy does is removing doubles when it can. So take this example. Uh, list zip with index. So zip with index actually creates uh, a new list with doubles with as first element the, the element from the original collection and a second element of the tuple, the index of iteration, so it starts with zero and et cetera. And if we zip with index and filter and then map, and then we return something that's not a tuple, if you optimize this with Galaxy streams, um, there's no tuple anymore whatsoever. So less object creation, plus you don't have the intermediate uh, collection. So you save, you end up saving a lot on these cases. Um, just 
Um, yeah, there's cases where you do need the doubles to be retained, so SkyC also detects that. So for instance here, if you print the tuple that you got from the previous, uh, the previous step, then obviously you need to create the tuple, you need to instantiate it, it escapes the, the scope of the optimization and everything. So you could have like a combination of aliases of the tuple values, uh, of the tuple, um, the root tuple, and SkyC is supposed to handle all of these cases nicely. <coughs> um, another big thing is side effects. So side effects, um, it's all about like pure and impure functions. Uh, I'm not a Haskellist, I'm not a theoretician, but yeah. So whatever mutates stuff or creates potentially non-reproducible uh, effects uh, in your closures can be bad. So in this case here, um, if you have a range, you map it once, you map it twice, but in each of the maps, you print something. Uh, the output of, it, of all of this is gonna be all the execution of this map, then all the execution of that map, and that's it. And the take has no effect on the on the print. Uh, you could have like lots like uh, more severe side effects. Like you could mutate a variable outside. You could uh, do a call to some service or whatever. <coughs> so what happens is. If we try to optimize very aggressively the, uh, the stream of operations, it might be a bit like making it lazy. It might be like converting it to an iterator. And then it would completely change the, the output. Because if this is all lazy, this map actually does not finish yet. Well, it, it returns an iterator, but like, the operations are not executed. And things start to be executed here. They, and they say, hey, I only take one element and that calls this one and this one, and that's it. And it doesn't, doesn't do at all the same output as the first one. So, Skyaxis streams, streams by default doesn't do aggressive optimizations. It doesn't consider that the uh, side effects can be ignored and that it can just do one loop, one way loop and break when the take decides to, to stop taking element. Um, so it, it does, side effect analysis, it tries to see what is good, what is not good, what can be combined together, and it just optimizes what it can. Um, so to do that, um, there's a set of trusted APIs, and there's levels of trust. <laughs> so in the category of almost safe or almost pure APIs, you have to string hash code equals plus plus plus, which in general are like the loose contract of them is that they should not have side effects. But it's a loose contract, it's not absolutely safe. And then you have immutable classes like integer or string, which we know are immutable. There is no operation you could call on them that would have dramatic side effects. Maybe some of them might trigger class loading, but this is uh, ignored in general. And um, so these are immutable, considered immutable. There's lots of whitelisted uh, pre-def utilities, like when you wrap an array into an array ops, things like that, or when you wrap an int in a rich int, it's still something immutable. <coughs> and immutable collections are an interesting example because you would think that they're immutable, uh, but they're not, <laughs> because they might contain um, elements that are not immutable. So if you call two string on a list, well, it might just do things, so it's almost safe. <laughs> um, so how is that used? Oh yeah, uh, sorry. So um, one last thing is uh, the optimizations sometimes make sense, sometimes don't uh, in terms of performance. For instance, this uh, huge blob is the implementation of list flat map. And you can not see, but <laughs> um, for those of you who know it, there's in maps and flat, flat maps, there's can build from objects that tell you how to create the output. And they do, they do lots of optimizations. They try to recognize the can build from that is passed and then they, they do some handcrafted optimization, whatever. Um, in the end, um, it turns out like rewriting this as a while loop is most often not a good idea um, if there's only one operation. And the rule of thumb is when there's more than one chained operation, so if you have a list, you flat map, and then you map, then the optimizations kick in, because 
the micro benchmarks show that it's worth um, like whatever the sizes of the collections. Um, so with the side effects and the worthiness of optimizations, um, some strategies are needed. So uh, the default strategy for Scalaxy Stream is to be safe, but not ultra safe. So safe means it's only about it's only going to optimize things it thinks are going to be faster. And it's going to take care of side effects, but it's going to trust uh, to string to behave. And if you want something stricter, you can tell it, oh, I want you to be safer, so I don't even trust to string. Uh, my plus methods might just break the hell loose. Um, so you can, you can decide what risk you're, you're ready to, to take. Um, the aggressive strategy um, doesn't care about side effects. Well, it does care, it does warn you, it does tell you, hey, um, you told me to be aggressive, I'm going to rewrite these two maps, even though there's identified side effects here and there that might just completely change your semantics, uh, but I'm going to do it uh, nonetheless. And then there's foolish. So foolish is, whatever you can rewrite, go for it. And that's actually useful for uh, Scala CL, because on the graphic card, you just can't use any library. You can't just package all of the standard libraries. So whatever uh, API code you're doing needs to be rewritten in something C-like. Uh, so while loops, for instance. Um, so that's the strategies available to you now. Um, so how do you use these strategies? You can just, if you're using the macro, you can just import um, the right strategy in the scope. And uh, it's just going to pick it up when you call the optimize uh, macro. If you don't use macros, you don't need anything blue here. So <coughs> if you use the compiler plugin, it's just going to optimize everything. And there's other ways to pass the strategy. It's going to be in command line or through Java properties. So <laughs> for users, the bottom line is things are faster and they're easy to set up. And you actually get these speedups on tight loops, uh, if the, the payload of your loop is uh, reasonably small, uh, that's bit speedups. For the, for the story, I, this is not a theoretical exercise. I actually came across real performance issues when I was working in a startup in Scala four years ago. And I uh, was doing Monte Carlo simulations in Scala, and I was trying to use the, the simplest data structures possible, just taking arrays, and I was wondering, why is it so slow and everything? And that's why I had to do this. And that's a real problem and a real solution to it. Um, a welcome side effect of uh, removing closures is also that you're going to end up with less classes. So in the example uh, projects that are on the, in, on the GitHub repo, um, the code reduction can go up to 60% size because it's mostly lambdas uh, that are in the example. And um, so in real life jar, like Scala library, uh, the initial um, test gave like five to 7% reduction uh, of the jar itself. So maybe even more with the classes. Um, so maybe you'd like to witness this for yourself. So um, I'm not sure who uses uh, Eclipse here. Okay, and who uses IntelliJ? <laughs> well, IntelliJ people, I'm sorry, I'm going to show you just the Eclipse plugin. Um, <laughs> right, IntelliJ users are, are so smart that they will figure it out anyway. Uh, so this is the, the way you set up things in Eclipse. You just go to the Scala compiler uh, screen, you give the path to the, the, the jar you downloaded from Scalaxy Streams, and and then you can just start using it. So that's in uh, uh, compiler plugin mode. So I kept I kept the um, the list of problems here open because as soon as I save, it compiles and boom, this galaxy talks to us and tells us they rewrote um, a range for each screen in here, and that the strategy is safe. Good. Um, so that's one simple example. Let's see for the uh, the four, the nested four that we saw earlier. The sun, I don't know. Um, I 
this. Yeah, so the message is still a bit hard to understand, but we can see that we have a range map, flat map, that recurses into a range map with filter, flat map that recurses into a range map, and that gives an index stack at the end. And all of this only creates one output collection instead of a gazillion. Um, so that's the example. And the last example is how you'd use it with a macro. So with a macro, um, you just need to include you just need to include uh, the optimized macro, and then boom, uh, it told us that it optimized range map. So here, I have my range and my map. But what happened to the other map? Well, um, side effects. <laughs> so here, it detected that uh, the two maps called println, and that's not good. You can't chain two println's like this, uh, because things might just not behave the same. So what if I tell him, yeah, um, I don't care, be aggressive. Then there we go. It did optimize map map. And it warns me that this side effect could cause issues, blah, blah, blah. And that side effect could cause issues, blah, blah, blah. So that's good. Um, likewise, with that take while, uh, take while it doesn't it doesn't get picked up here because well if you don't take everything uh, in the while loop if you break before the end then all the side effects that would have been executed in the map uh, normally wouldn't have happened so you need to dive to the aggressive here as well and then yeah. Uh, it warns you and it just works. So yeah, I'm not gonna show you the other examples. They're pretty much the same. So that's the cool part of Galaxy, that's the user part. And for those of you who are macro developers, know that there is uh, some grungy stuff behind and the learning curve is steep and blah, blah, blah. So, um, just a peek at how it looks like on the inside. So the macro is dealing with expression trees, abstract, not expression trees, abstract syntax trees. Uh, so a function will have valid defs for its arguments, will have a block of uh, um, statements or values at the end, uh, assignments that refer to identifiers, uh, application of function, type application of the symbol, selection of the symbol on an, on an, on an identifier, and blah, blah, blah. And all of these um, ASTs may be annotated by symbols. So symbols and types. I didn't show the types because it's already quite heavy. Um, so types, symbols are something extremely important because when you want to match a collection, you don't want to match by name. You don't want to match something that is called list uh, because it might be another list. It might not be the, 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 the symbol you're actually looking for. So symbols give the identity to objects and types give and um, the problem is, um, <coughs> when you try to type a tree, uh, the typer stops. Well, whenever it, it finds a type somewhere, it doesn't recurse. And, and once you put types, you can't remove them reliably. There's some issues in the compiler. So, um, so everything we do, so we need, we need the types. So, so we need to type the, the trees that we take as input. And since the compiler is never going to go inside our code by itself, because it's not going to retype something that's partially typed, we need to put the types in the macros. <coughs> and the problem is, as soon as you do this, uh, well, type symbols are actually recursive, so if you define a symbol somewhere, it's gonna know its parent, uh, its parent symbol, so a, a, a val uh, is gonna know that it belongs to a function, that this function belongs to a def, that belongs to a class, and things become interesting, because we remove functions in this. <laughs> so, yeah. This example here, we have a um, closure in the map that is going to be completely removed because we replace it by uh, a while loop. And inside here, we have um, closure anonymous that just 
actually believing that it's owned by the closure we removed. And that's a chain of ownership. So <clears throat> what happens in the rewrite is we delete the original owner of the, of the closure. And the problem is um, the compiler is going to complain heavily. It's just going to crash in the later phases of compilation because um, the phase goes, uh, called uh, uh, lambda lift um, later in the compilation expects everything to be rightly attributed to their owner. So what we do, what I do in Galaxy Streams is I have to force the new parent to adopt its former grandchild. And that's not pretty. Uh, there's no public APIs to do this. And it just takes like 10 lines, but it does result to Java reflections. So yeah. Um, as a side note, uh, structural types in compiler plugins just don't work well because there's dependent types and the compiler just bails out in lots of cases. Um, another hack that's used in Galaxy is ahead of time typing. So as I said, we need to create, we need to put types on everything we output because the typer is not going to pass after us. And we also need to create symbols. So if you create a, a, a variable somewhere, it needs to have an identity and like, that's part of the typing. The problem is macros don't currently expose an API to create symbols. So <laughs> the way to do that is to run the typer artificially on some random, um, random expression. So this queue here is the same as I showed before uh, for matching trees, but it's, here it's to build trees. So it's both a creator and an extractor. And here I create a fake, uh, a fake block of code, and I type it, which is going to incidentally create the symbols for these in the current context. And, and then I just extract all of this, and I can assemble all the bits that are correctly typed and um, have the correct symbols. So that's the kind of hoops uh, we have to go through. I have to go through. Um, so are you ready for Skalaxy Streams? Um, version 3 is reasonably experimental. Which means there's no known bugs, there's only one limitation. And um, if you're risk averse, you can always limit the risks by using the macro and say, hey, I only optimi optimize this bit of code. Um, and if you're adventurous, you can just use the plugin, and then everything is going to be optimized in the same mode. Um, <clears throat> right now, <laughs> the plugin builds almost all of Scala library. When I say almost, it actually builds it all, but there's some errors that are recovered because it tries and when it fails, it just says, ah, I won't optimize. But um, yeah, uh, things are almost, um, almost perfect, let's say. Um, as I said, you know, there's a com um, competitor project <laughs> that's uh, way more recent. Uh, it's called Scala Blitz, and my understanding is well, it does parallelization automatically of your code, but I don't think it does uh, side effect analysis. And they say they don't fuse loops yet, so they don't chain calls. But definitely another player to look. Um, so yeah, the the thing that's most needed now is to get feedback and find if there's any lingering bugs, and I'm sure there are. So please, please, please file bugs if you want to give it a go. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Have you tried this with um, Scala.js? Um, the question is, have I tried this with Scala.js? I haven't. Uh, but Scala.js supports uh, out-of-the-box Scala.xy loops, uh, which actually builds upon uh, Scala.xy streams. So historically, well, there's a long history, but um, Scala.xy loops is a simplified version of Scala.xy streams that only simplifies uh, loops on on ranges, and um, well, it's easier to easier to make and everything. So I released that before I released Galaxy Streams, and Galaxy JS is bundled with it. So I would assume it would just work uh, as well with this new version. Yes. Uh, you told us about speed increase. Do you have some numbers about uh, memory savings? No. Nope. Um, so the question is. Uh, I yeah, sorry. <laughs> I gave numbers about the, the speed increase. Do I have uh, figures about memory uh, memory consumption? I don't yet. Um, I have high hopes for it, but um, I haven't had the time to use management gains or whatever. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Any help is welcome for that.
Yeah. Uh, you, you talked about uh, use, like, using two stream, uh, two iterators, sorry, uh, to to try to optimize uh, basically the, the original code. Mm -hmm. Have you tried view force also? How how is this help? So the reputation of view force uh, from the Scala to eight days is quite bad. I'm not sure why. I think they kind of keep the data, the cache. I'm not sure exactly, but. Uh, when I tried it, it was a very long time ago, it was really, really disappointing, even compared to iterators. Uh, I have tried since. Um, okay. okay. A long time ago, too. But the thing is, it's, it's probably, well, it's going to keep the, the closures and it's going to keep making more mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. So the, the, yeah, I don't expect it to be faster today. So that the side effect analysis, if I put a, a, well, objects of my own class into a collection, mm -hmm. uh, will uh, Scala actually optimize this? I mean, will it detect that calling methods on objects of my class are safe? No, or not. <laughs> so that's something I'd like to add in the next versions, is um, a pure annotation that would tell, tell the compiler, hey, uh, you don't know this class, but trust it. Just optimize like whatever call. Uh, so that's definitely on the to do list. Um, I think there is there is some library already to do that. I, I don't remember the name, but there is some project to address all those effect tracking issues. Okay. So yeah. you might might want to look, look yeah. for it. I know there there was a, a project at EPFL uh, where they investigated like adding the side effect to the type system. But I think they were actually modifying the type system to a point where it could not it could not make it into Scala the official Scala. But yeah, if you have a link, I'm I'm all oh, yes. Thanks. <coughs> Anyone else? Okay. Well, I am. I think I'm loud enough, so I can ask without microphone. Uh, so. <laughs> So if you call external functions, by default they're gonna be considered as potentially with side effects. Because it, it's not gonna follow, it's not gonna track external functions and, uh, and say, hey, are you actually in your implementation? Are you actually safe? But it, it doesn't even know, maybe maybe you're gonna build but today. I use aggressive optimization. Will it work yeah. something yeah. Or, or it will yeah. work with, well? Uh, aggressive, aggressive, um, aggressive optimizations just don't care about side effects. They warn you that there might be some, uh, where is this? Yeah. But I mean, if uh, my, my functions do not contain uh, such side effects and I do foolish or aggressive optimization, mm -hmm. uh, does it mean that they should work well? Well, you decide. If you, you enter danger zone if you go for aggressive or foolish. So you have to know if your methods, well, you have to look at your code and say, is it going to be safe? It's going to warn you. It might not be safe. It might not be your there are side effects that would not be considered safe by the optimizer. So you have to exercise your, your judgment there. But if I am absolutely sure that it yep. uh, doesn't do any side effects, so it just yep. analyzes what goes in and goes out, it should work well, right? Uh, yeah, it should. And if I, uh, if I apply optimize to a long, long chain with a lot of collection functions like root buys and lab and so on, uh, should it be safe? So. So group by, for instance, is not uh, covered by these optimizations yet. Um, there's a full list of the, the operations that are optimized and all the sources and the sinks. Um, but yeah, like individually, if like, so it, it looks at the, the whole chain to decide whether it's safe or not. Uh, so for instance, one side effect in the chain is fine, uh, but well, it's fine unless you have something that might break the flow uh, after. Like if you have a side effect in the map and then a filter, then it might not is not safe. Uh, if you have a side effect, then uh, drop well, it's not safe. But if you have a side effect, then map, 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 it's safe. Okay. Um, so it, it looks at all the stream, it looks at the recursive stream as well. Like if you have a flat map, it goes, goes inside, gathers all the side effects, and depending on the strategies, it decides what to do. Thank you. Cheers.
is this something that you're considering? Um, we we had had a few talks on um, uh, the type um, type uh, thing uh, compilers. Uh, is this something you can imagine going into the compiler or? Um... Uh, yes. So four years ago, uh, I did talk to um, to Paul Phillips and to the the Scala team, and Paul Phillips was extremely. Um, like excited by that, and he said, "Yeah, that would be great, but <laughs> uh, but be aware, we will probably never go in because because of lots of reasons. Uh, my understanding is the main reason is the Scala team uh, has a policy of not uh, having specific or like library specific optimizations because the collections are not part of the language, and uh, they instead favor better optimizations, generic ones like inlining, like." Um, yeah, mostly lining. And also in the library itself, as I showed, uh, they did lots of work on pretty much all of the, the list methods uh, that kind of cheat. Like, the design of collections is great in that you could just use the base class of that implementation and it would just work all across the, the, the collection hierarchy. But like, in practice, they had to re-implement in lots of places so that it's actually performing. So. So yeah, I don't think it's going to make it in Scala just because of that. Because um, with uh, Miguel uh, Icaza's, uh, or Miguel something, I'm sorry, um, there's an optimizer being developed into 11 uh, that is only slowly coming into official Scala, but like, has potentially lots of better optimizations in stock uh, for the next versions. So uh, yeah, uh, maybe that's going to reduce the need for, for such a plugin. And yeah, inlining, I guess, is going to be the big, uh, big thing. Right now, inlining works with some simple range cases. So range for each uh, can be inlined. And as soon as you nest it, uh, things go wrong because the, the compiler like, decides always oh, it's worth the inlining, what's the, the amount of code I inline, and it bails out quite, quite quickly. So yeah. And even, even when it inlines, it still keeps the, the allocation of the range object, for instance. So yeah. So long well, I have, okay, I have, may, may I ask a question because, <laughs> okay, and what about partial functions, uh, when you have maps with a lot of partial functions inside? Mm -hmm. um, so partial functions, I love them, except when, when they have more than one case. <laughs> um, so <laughs> this case works great, and if you have two cases, then so yeah, it works. So you mean that uh, I should uh, try to avoid partial functions with more than one case, right? Uh, yes. Thank you. Yes. Or, or you should contribute something that handles more than one case. <laughs> Optimize because that's the point where the macro resolves the implicit. But uh, yeah, you can in the same file you can just open many blocks. Actually, I do that in the test. I like test the four strategies each in their own block, and uh, yeah, they all get different optimizations. Oh, a question about uh, Scala streams. Oh. So uh, you mentioned that it's. It's kind of SBT plugin that uh, optimize everything by default, right? Uh, it's a compiler plugin, yes. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, and uh, what if I uh, use Galaxy Stream, but I want to not uh, optimize part of my code? So there's two ways to do this. So, for instance, if you don't want to optimize your tests, which is highly advised because don't optimize both the testy and the tester. Uh, you can just in um, uh, do I have the page somewhere? You can just uh, you can tell SPT not to not to execute a uh, plugin. Uh, it's on the it's on the the it's on the Galaxy Streams uh, read. You can tell SPT to not run uh, the, the compiler plugin in tests. Uh, you can also include strategy none 
in the files you want to skip. Um, so, so, so you mean that I uh, just uh, import, so if I have a project that uses Galaxy Streams and I want uh, several methods to go without optimization, so I just need to make an import of strategy none? Uh, you, you just need to import, yeah, exactly, strategy none. Just, just to, uh, so such import should be available for these methods, right? Sorry. Uh, I mean that I have several methods uh -huh. that uh, I don't want to optimize yeah. and it can be inside of object for instance mm -hmm. and uh, everything else I want to optimize so yeah. I just do import inside of these methods or... Yeah, you, 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 in a local scope you say this block is going to be a strategy none and then we'll, uh, you just put it in scope before the functions and if you're using the ID and you look at the output of your compiler you will, you will see very clearly what is optimized and what is not. So uh, okay, you told us that, as I understood, the uh, guys uh, of ScalaJS, I mean Sebastian and other code devs, uh, they already use uh, uh, Scalax, uh, Scalaxy for some optimizations, yes. right? They, they provide Scalaxy loops, so in ScalaJS and JS Fiddle, uh, that you can try online in your browser, uh, you can just add optimized at the end of the, it's a different syntax than this one, but it's built on the same rewrite engine. And yeah, you but I mean, uh, will I get uh, some conflicts if I will apply Galaxy Streams to my ScalaJS projects? Uh, probably not, it should not. No. So if I, uh, if I use Galaxy uh, Stream, so uh, it should, yeah, should optimize with Galaxy Streams, not yeah. but with default version. Yeah. It should definitely, you can mix and match, because the, um, the entry call of Galaxy Streams is not the same as Galaxy Loops, that's in JS Fiddle, and at the macro level, everything is explicit. The macro doesn't automatically optimize your code, you have to call it for it to happen, so it's safe. Thank you. Cheers. Any other questions? Thanks, guys.